Okay, in this video, we're gonna look at the notion of a surjective function. So by definition, we say a function from A to B is surjective if for all B, there exists an A and A where F of A equals B. In other words, every element of the codomain has an element in the domain which is mapped to that element. So generally, the first thing that you look at when you see these are these little picture diagrams. So here's a picture diagram for a surjective function. So notice we have four elements in the domain and three elements in the codomain, but every element in the codomain is mapped onto by um, an element in the domain. So this one is mapped onto by the first one, the second one by this one down here, and then this third one is mapped onto by two of these guys in the domain. And that's okay. You just have to be mapped on by at least one. But then the second example down here is not surjective because notice this second guy in the codomain is missed. So this first, third, and fourth um, member of the codomain is mapped onto by something over here in the domain, but the second guy is not mapped onto. So now we could see some examples from calculus and um, maybe one of which would be if we consider the function f of x equals sine of x. And now if we consider this as a function from the interval 0 to 2 pi to the real numbers, this is not surjective. And we know that because f of x is always between negative 1 and 1. And so, uh, for example, f of x is not equal to 2 for all x. So, in other words, 2 is an element of the codomain that is missed. But we can kind of hack this a little bit and instead view the same function, but now we're going from 0 to 2 pi to the interval negative 1 to 1, and now we know that this is surjective. Because f will achieve every number between negative 1 and 1. And we can actually check that kind of carefully by noticing that sine of pi over 2 equals 1, and then sine of 3 pi over 2 equals negative 1. And so it achieves the largest number in the codomain and the smallest number in the codomain. But then, using the fact that sine is continuous and the intermediate value theorem will show that it maps onto every element of the codomain. Okay, good. So I'm going to clean up the board and then we're going to look, look at an outline of a proof um, that a function is surjective. Okay, so let's look at the outline of a proof that some function is surjective. And it's really important that we look at this outline because there's a bit of a trick to it. And so, again, our claim is that f is surjective. And notice, there's this really important side calculation. So the side calculation is not in the proof. And in fact, the side calculation in reverse will end up in the proof, and it will end up in the proof at the end. So let's look at the outline of the proof. So we suppose that B is in B, and so B is an arbitrary element. And remember, our goal is to find an element A from the domain that's mapped to B. So we do that via this side calculation. So we solve the equation f of A equals B for A. And so what that will give us is A equals some sort of combination of terms with B. Okay, great. Now we go back to the proof, and when we're writing up the proof, it seems like a little bit magical, because what we'll do is we'll consider A equal to just this complicated uh, object involving terms with this uh, B. And so that's what we'll put here, what we got from our side calculation. And the next thing that we want to do is say something like observe that or notice that or something that relays that similar idea that when you plug this value of a, which we've just grabbed from the ether, into our function, we get our arbitrary b from the codomain. And so, and in fact, this calculation right here 
is the reverse of what we did over here when we solved for A. And so that's how that side calculation shows up here. It shows up in reverse. But this equation right here shows that F is surjective. So again, it's really important to do the side calculation and not include it in the proof except in reverse down here. So when reading these types of proofs, it should always be a little bit surprising when you're reading it from top to bottom that this value of A is just kind of like given. Okay, good. So now I'm going to clean up the board and we're going to look at some examples. Okay, so for our first example, we'll consider the function from r to r given by f of a equals 3a minus 7. So in other words, that's just a line. We want to show that thing is surjective. So let's start our proof here. So our proof is going to start just the same way that we looked at in the outline. So let's suppose that we have some element b from the codomain, which is r, and we're going to consider A equals, but now we have to stop because we need to input something from our side calculation. Again, the side calculation won't show up in your solution that you hand in, um, but it's important to do. So let's look at the side calculation. We want to solve 3A minus 7 equals B. Recall we want to solve F of A equals B for A. And so, you know, that's not too hard to do in this case. So we get 3a equals b plus 7, which makes a equal to b plus 7 over 3. Great. So that's the value of a that we're going to consider right here. So we'll say b plus 7 over a. Sorry, over 3. Good. And notice that's going to be a real number um, for any b, just by kind of its uh, obvious fact. And so, so now the notice, next thing that we'll do is we'll observe that if we do f of a, that's going to be um, 3a minus 7, but that's going to be equal to 3 times b plus 7 over 3 minus 7 by the value of a that we constructed, but that's going to be exactly b by simple algebra, but that means that F is surjective. And let's see, why does it mean that F is surjective? Because what we've done is we've taken an arbitrary element from the codomain, we've constructed an element from the domain, that when we stick that element from the domain into the function, we get our arbitrary element from the codomain. Okay, good. I'm going to clean up the board and then we're going to do one more example. Okay, so for our final example, we'll look at the following function. So we've got h, which goes from z cross z to q, and it's defined by h of mn equals m over the absolute value of n plus 1. We want to show that this function is surjective. So we'll use, use the same outline that we've been using. So let's suppose that we have some element from the codomain, in other words, from Q. So we can always write elements of the rational numbers as P over Q. Great. And so here we're using the structure of the rational numbers. And the next thing that we want to do is consider m comma n equals, but now we don't know what this needs to be equal to. We do know that when we plug this into the function, we should get p over q. So now what we'll do is do our side calculation. Which is setting h of m comma n equal to p over q. In other words, we want to set m over absolute value n plus 1 equal to p over q. Okay, good. But now, notice this is going to be equal if um, m equals p, great, and then notice that the absolute value of n plus 1 can be equal to q, which means that the absolute value of n equals q minus 1. Good. In other words, we have n equals either um, q 
minus one or negative Q minus one. That's what it means for the absolute value of N to equal Q minus one. But we might as well take this first one because we want one element that's gonna be mapped to P over Q, not all elements. Um, that's all we need to show this thing is surjective. So again, we'll set M comma N equal to what we got from that over there. So this is gonna be P and then Q minus one. Okay, so now we'll finish it off. So let's plug this value into H. So we have H of M N. So that's going to be equal to M over absolute value of N plus one. So that's gonna be equal to P over absolute value of Q minus one um, plus one. Okay, so now we might be a little stuck with these absolute values, but notice what we can do up here in order to unstick ourselves. And that is we could have started from the beginning assuming that Q is bigger than or equal to one, right? So we know that when we write a rational number as a ratio of integers, this Q has to be um, not equal to zero but it could be positive or negative. But if it's negative, we could just take that negative and absorb it into the P upstairs, meaning that we can always assume that Q is positive. Great, but if Q is positive, then Q minus one is non-negative, which means we can get rid of those absolute value signs, which means we get this as Q minus one plus one, or P over Q. Great, but that's exactly what we need to show that H is surjective, and that finishes our proof. Okay, that's a good place to end this video.